to Pocketables Weekly News Roundup number 10. Uh, once again, you'll probably be seeing this on Saturday or Sunday. Um, busy week at my day job, but uh, we have some exciting content coming, hopefully in the next week or two, that uh, is actually based on that. We get a look into a Microtik CRS-354 and CRS-328 POE switch. These are um, excellent value per dollar, big 28 and, well, yeah, big 24 and 48 port switches with uh, features like 10 gig uplinks and even 40 gig or larger switch. Um, those will be coming in the next few weeks. We take time to pull them out of the box, open them up, take a look at what's going inside and talk about some of the features that are available on them. So keep an eye out for those. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. And uh, that'll be in the next few weeks, but back to the focus of these news roundups, which is what's been going on this week. This week has actually been fairly quiet, um, with two exceptions. We had Prime Day this week, which anyone who used our links to help support Pocketables, we, we thank you. I know we didn't make a ton of noise on it um, directly, because nothing really stood out to us. However, um, anyone following other news outlets probably was just bombarded with it. I know my news feed from Monday up until even Friday was just full of various Prime Day posts and announcements and analysis and just more than uh, I cared to see about it. And it was not something that I wanted to add to and just bombard you, our viewers and readers, with. On to more interesting notes this week. Um, NVIDIA Quadro is unfortunately no longer a thing. Uh, Quadro brand cards have been around for a long time, and these have been the de facto standard for professional workstations. It was just a given. If you were doing video editing, photo editing, uh, anything professional that you made money on as for 3D modeling, various types of day of analysis, you got a Quadro. You didn't get a GeForce card. Um, you had Quadros for big workstations. That was just the way it was. You got additional features for um, large memory pools and various bonuses to things like floating point calculation. And some of that was artificial. Uh, a GeForce card has most of the same hardware that a Quadro does, but what it doesn't have is certified drivers to allow certain performance benefits. It doesn't have things like ECC memory, and it will typically have less RAM. Um, for comparison, last generation, a Quadro 6000, an RTX 6000, would have twice as much memory I believe it was a 24 gig frame buffer as the consumer cards, which would have been a 2080 Ti. So that's not to say that NVIDIA is leaving that market. They're simply retiring the Quadro branding. Um, this generation, we don't have a Quadro RTX 6000. We just have the um, RTX A6000, which is going to be packing an even more massive 48 gig frame buffer this time around. Um, and these are, they're still big workstation cards, but what has happened is some of NVIDIA's other lineups are also being pared down at the same time. So previously we had Tesla cards, and Tesla cards were supposed to go in servers and were supposed to be dedicated compute cards. And you started to get this overlap. There were a couple of Teslas with video output. There were Quadros that were capable of doing the same things as the Tesla cards. So they are condensing all of these lineups under one set of branding. I personally am probably a little more attached to the Quadro branding than some of you may be. I tend to use them in my desktop because I come from a engineering and 3D modeling background. Um, and there are advantages sometimes to running Quadro cards, even for consumer applications. Uh, my current desktop, the only way to get a single slot card with performance equal to uh, 1070, 
was to get a Quadro P4000. Hopefully we continue to get, you know, single slot A4000 cards, although this may be the first generation that that doesn't happen with how big Ampere is. Uh, so anyway, I'll miss it, but it's not like the cards themselves are going away. They're just being renamed. One more bit of hardware news on the PC side. AS Rock has launched their new Nook 1100 box series units. These are UCFS, yeah, UCFF systems, which means they're comparable to Intel's Nook in size. They are putting the new Tiger Lake chips in these. I'm really excited to see these new Nook 1100 systems. These new Nook 1100s were getting three different systems. You, there's an i3, an i5, and an i7. And quite frankly, typically when I see a lineup like this, I say the i5 is going to be the best value per dollar. I don't see any reason why that would be any different here since mobile i7s, low voltage models, kind of suck. So with the i5 and the i7 here, the differences aren't particularly huge. We're talking roughly 300 megahertz at the bottom end and 500 megahertz at the top end. Considering that these are both 28 watt chips that are going to be in the same form factor, this little box sized PC, I expect them to perform similarly. And in previous examples where I've had a chance to test an ultra low voltage Intel i5 against an Intel i7, what I found was that when paired with the same cooling solution, unless that cooling solution was just over-designed and let the i7 run at its full turbo the entire time, you got roughly the same performance because once you pump 28 watts into it, you get the same output. Um, that part aside, you know, so basically if you're looking at these, it's really between the i3 and the i5 and just Pick whichever is appropriate for your workload. Um, they're packing dual Intel network cards, which is a huge feature, and I love seeing little boxes like this with dual networking. They make excellent firewalls. We are getting uh, one M2 PCIe, one SATA port for a 2.5-inch drive. We're getting Intel Wi-Fi, AX, one board. And then USB, we're getting an array of ports that's maybe a little on the low side, but not terrible considering the overall form factor. We're getting one USB Type A and two Type C's on the front, and they're, they're all 3.2 Gen 2, which means that these are USB 10 gig ports. On the rear, we're also getting another pair of USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A. Um, display outputs, we're getting an HDMI, one DisplayPort 1.4, and then both of the front USB-C also double up as DisplayPort 1.4 ports as well. Not sure if you can light up all four ports on an Intel graphics card simultaneously like that. Usually, I see systems limited to three display outputs total when using an Intel graphics driver or graphics adapter. Um, that said, that may have changed with the new systems. Even if it hasn't, having all those options is good. And being able to connect three displays to a system that is that size is always excellent. And then audio is going to be, be provided by uh, a Realtek audio solution. One 3.5 millimeter combo port, fairly standard and fair for a system like that. What I don't have... And therefore, I can't say if these are really a good value is any pricing information yet. Um, that kind of detail. Oh, memory isn't socketed or memory isn't soldered to the system. You get two SODIMM slots, which means you can afford 60 or if you can afford 32 gig SODIMMs, that you can cram 64 gigs of RAM in there, which means especially that i5 is going to be a nice little system if you want to have it be a firewall, do a virtualized firewall, run some other VMs on there, um, various little storage uh, type applications if you want a small NAS. I know two SSDs isn't huge, um, although today if you were comfortable using QLC as your storage volume, which at 8 terabytes I might be comfortable with, much smaller than that I'd be 
concerned about the longevity. Uh, you could cram two 8 terabyte QLC drives in there and run a RAID 1 between them. Uh, you'd have to have one 2.5 and one M2, but you could certainly do it and uh, then boot off USB, something like FreeNAS or uh, Unraid. So, lots of options for a little system like this. Um, the fact that it's got dual network ports immediately makes it an option as far as firewall appliances are concerned. Plenty of storage options for it. The 2.5 gig, gig networking is definitely something beneficial as we start to see more and base T networking show up in general. Um, hopefully we get some N base T switches and to look at soon. So far everything I've shown you has been N base T adapters and then hooked up to uh, CRS 328, which although an excellent switch requires you buy an SFP module in order to use 2.5, 5, and 10 base T. It's all fiber based by default. So one of the big items this week was Apple's high speed event. That's probably the biggest line item we have for this week's news post. Starting off with the more predictable item, Apple announced and, and released iOS 14.1. 14.1 brings support for the new iPhone 12, 12 mini, etc. We'll get into the phone models in a minute. Um, it also brings a couple of things like improvements to the camera and uh, some improvements to the iPad that launched earlier this year. Uh, so this is a relatively minor revision to iOS and the big headline item with it is support for the new iPhone models. Before we get to the phones, Apple is expanding their HomePod lineup. Uh, previously, it was very expensive to get a HomePod device at all. Um, they launched a new HomePod Mini. I believe it's got a $99 price tag. And uh, it's supposed to be you know, built for sound first. I personally don't have a ton of experience with the Apple HomeKit stuff. So I can't comment on its sound quality. I haven't had a chance to listen to one yet. But it looks like it's a well-built device. It looks like it's going to be very competitive with devices like the Google Home that was recently launched, as well as Amazon's Alexa and Echo devices, as well as Amazon's various Echo devices. Um, all that said, one smart speaker does not an ecosystem make. I think Apple is going to be playing catch up here for a while. Some of their stuff, it's not badly made, it's not badly designed, um, but isn't quite competitive with. Google Home and Amazon Alexa for cohesiveness in the ecosystem and available features. It's very easy to throw a Fire Stick or a Chromecast on a TV for less than 50 bucks and be done. Apple TVs are, granted, more feature full, but a bit more expensive. So I, I hope that next year we see some kind of shrunk down Apple TV that just adds various functionality to devices themselves. In fact, I'd like to have that for work because every so often being able to support AirPlay natively without having to invest in the latest, greatest uh, Apple TV would be a benefit to us on occasion. Um, we had that a long time ago when we had more Apple people in the building and lost it when our hardware kind of just fell off the support radar. I think we had old Apple TV 2 models. And now for the part that everyone's been waiting for. During this event, Apple launched not one, not two, but four individual phones. We have a new iPhone 12, 12 mini, 12 Pro, and 12 Pro Max, all with varied screen sizes and camera configurations. Um, one thing that was nice to see is that we've got a return to the aluminum camphor band with flat screen, which I think was one of Apple's better phone designs. Uh, I personally like seeing that. We also have the same processor in all these devices. And uh, that means that people who wanted a smaller iPhone used to have to 
and wait for the new iPhone SE or whatever the, the cost-reduced model using older technology was. But with the Mini being introduced this time around, alongside everything else, at least it provides an option for people who want a smaller phone, although there's still trade-offs to trade-offs to things like the camera capabilities. One thing that didn't happen at this event that I was very disappointed to see is that the iPhone still is not using a USB-C connector. Um, there's also been a change in how Apple is handling things like charging. None of the new iPhones, in fact, they've decided to start taking it out of some of the old iPhones, are going to ship with headphones or a charger. You'll still get a charging cable, um, although it is a USB-C to lightning charging cable, which means that it won't plug into most people's wall adapters that are going to be USB Type A, so you'll still need to have a USB Type C port somewhere to plug it in. You'll also have to either buy AirPods or buy lightning ear pods or buy a lightning to audio jack adapter if you want to listen to audio with this. And on one hand, I I see a little bit of Apple's reasoning here, um, it, but it also feels like an admission that their market's not growing. So the idea is that the bulk of people buying these iPhones have previous generation iPhones, which means that they already have headphones that they use that work with the lightning port that they already have chargers, although their chargers aren't going to be USB-C to lightning. They're going to be type A to lightning in most instances. Um, so that's going to <laughs> mean that they have to buy adapters still. Well, I suppose they could use their existing charger and charging cable if they haven't fallen apart as those Apple provided cables tend to be sensitive to fraying based on how they're bent. I rarely see one in pristine condition. So they're, they're claiming this will reduce e-waste. They didn't really reduce the price of the phones enough for me to think that it's going to do anything but really boost their bottom line. They, they did cut the price on the accessories in the Apple Store, um, which is a nice gesture. Hey, we took that out of the box, but now it's cheaper to buy it if you actually do need it. That said, they didn't bring the price of the phone itself down with it to keep up with that. So, there's some trade-offs there. I'm not 100% sure which way that's going to pan out. I've heard some people say it will reduce e-waste. I've heard some sources say it's going to increase e-waste because people are just going to have to buy all this new stuff anyway and throw out all those Type A chargers that they had that won't work with that C to Lightning cable. That could go either way. Um, one item I was glad to see change and, and reintroduced was the new MagSafe charging. Um, so this is a new step in wireless charging for Apple. My understanding is that there's going to be an alignment magnet that's supposed to help the phone line up with the charging coil and kind of keep it stuck in the right place while you're charging. Um, not quite what I had in mind when they said MagSafe. I, I would have actually been okay with a new proprietary port if it was magnetic on the phone. That says someone who doesn't really like proprietary connectors. That is just a, a brief overview of the Apple event. There'll be a couple of links to that. In fact, there'll be links to everything we've talked about so far in the description below. Um, one thing I do want to mention, and this is a story that, you know, we published ourselves this week, is the Plugable, what brand is this? The HD Video Capture USB HDMI device. Uh, I'm, I'm using it right now for this. I've used it for my news broadcast for a couple of weeks. There's been a link to it, but I hadn't published the video on it specifically, talking about what it is, so there'll be a link to the article that I wrote on it with the video embedded in the description below. And with all that, I do want to um, once again thank everyone who used our Amazon links. They'll be in the description again. That helps support Pocketables. Some things like that USB video adapter and some of the other stuff I'm looking at for testing regarding stuff like the pocket meter is purchased using uh, the affiliate rewards from those. 
Um, if anyone has any questions about anything we covered in today's news article, let us know and we will either reply to the comment or cover it further in depth in its own video. I do want to thank our patrons who help support Pocketables and make content like this possible. I also want to thank Electrix who provided our opening and closing themes. Um, definitely check out his channel. There'll be a link to it in the description. And I want to thank everyone for watching. Thank you.